Okay, uh, but I put the slides already. For uh, we have two chapters left, and I think we have three days. No, more than that. And we have like four, four uh, classes left. I think four or five. Uh, so we have plenty of time uh, to talk about the new chapters. Um, and I don't think the new chapters are uh, very difficult, especially this one is very straightforward. So this one is capital budgeting chapter. And we're going to go back to our uh, very, one of the f uh, very first slides. And here, uh, if you remember, uh, the objective of the firm was to maximize what? Yes. Uh, shareholders' value, to maximize the value of the firm, which translates into increasing the market value. Uh, sorry, uh, it translates into uh, increasing the shareholder value, which translates into increasing the equity value. Uh, but for the equity value, we're looking at market value, not the book value. Why? Book value is, is, is historical looking. Market value, on the other hand, uh, it is uh, forward looking and it also has information about what people think about that particular stock. So to maximize the value of the firm, we are trying to maximize the uh, market value of equity, market value of shares, basically. And in that uh, perspective, we said there are three main, uh, three main decisions a CEO should make. One is the capital budgeting decision. And in, the, in this case, uh, the, the CEO or the finance manager should find projects that will add value to the firm. Why? The better the projects uh, the firm takes, the more value it will create. And actually, if you think about firms, firms are basically a cumulative uh, organism of different projects. The more good projects the firm has, the better the value of the firm will be. So this was the first thing. And then we said after finding uh, the, the good projects, the next step will be where this money will come from, which was the financing decision. So we are trying to maximize value through debt or equity decisions. Companies can issue debt, like bonds, or they can issue equities, like common stocks to raise money, or companies can use internal funds as well, which was retained earnings, if you think, think about it. Um, so after finding the good projects, finding the money, and taking the project, hopefully the company will have some uh, uh, value created. And in that case, this excess value can be returned to investors. Uh, like dividend payments is one way to pay out the ex excess money a company generates, or maybe there will be stock repurchases. Uh, so with stock repurchasing, companies can repurchase their own stocks from shareholders and the exchange of money. So these are both uh, different ways to pay out uh, money to the, to the investors. So in this chapter and in the following chapter, we're going to focus on capital budgeting decisions. So what we will try to do is we will try to find good projects, which projects are good, which projects we should take, which projects uh, we should avoid. And in that, uh, in that decision, there are two important things. One is for each project, we need to be able to figure out the cash flows related to projects. What are the expenses? What are the costs and everything? Uh, we should put those cash flows in the right place on the timeline, and we should uh, also be able to forecast those cash flows well. So we should know the magnitude of those cash flows as well. After finding the cash flows for invest investments, then uh, what we should do is we should discount those cash flows using the discount rate that will reflect the true risk of the project. So. I don't know whether you're aware of it, but this slide is basically cumulative of everything we saw in this chapter. So first, the, the cash flow finding part is from the cash statement of cash flows, or it's from the income statement. So we should figure out what cash flows are. So these are the accounting chapters, actually. And we will spend more time on it in the following chapter. So we will find the cash flows. After finding the cash flows, then you should use the right discount rate. Which, uh, where can we find the discount rate? Remember the risk and return chapter? Hmm? So for the discount rate, actually, we use different things. 
So if you want to focus on cost of equity, if you remember, we had CAPM, right? So basically, the cost of equity is equal to risk fee rate plus beta, which measures the systematic risk, and market risk premium, which is the market rate minus the risk fee rate. So this is one way of finding the cost of capital, cost of equity. Uh, saying that this will be financed by equity only. We are kind of ignoring cost of debt. Finding cost of debt is easy. What is cost of debt? If you go to the bank, take some money from the bank, what is the cost of debt? It is the interest, interest rate. The, the bank will charge you. So finding cost of debt is easy. Another uh, thing of co uh, what is cost of debt when we have bonds? Do you remember? Cost of debt. If you're issuing bonds, how can I find the cost of debt, cost of bond? Coupon. Uh, it's not coupon. What is the discount rate you use when you have bond cash flows? Yield to maturity. So when I say cost of debt, you can use the interest rate if you have private debt, bank loan. And if you're using bond, if you're using public debt, then you're going to use yield to maturity as your cost of debt. Coupon rates are important only for uh, calculating coupon payments, that's it. We are, uh, we are after discount rate. The discount rate you use in bonds was yield to maturity, if you remember. Okay? So this is cost of debt. Uh, if you use equity, then this is going to be cost of equity. Uh, another, do you remember another uh, formula for co uh, cost of equity? Um, so we had something like this, if you remember. So if you have a dividend growth model, from here you can also use the discount rate, which was, um, is it true? Is it just opposite? Okay. So you can also find cost of equity from dividend discount model, or you can find it from, from CAPM. So if you're only using equity, you can use cost of equity. If you're only using cost of uh, debt to finance your project, you can use cost of debt. Uh, if you're using a mix of it, we're not covering it in this uh, class, but uh, you're, you're, you're going to use weighted average cost of capital. So in the weighted average cost of capital, you're basically taking the weighted average of those two financing resources. So you can have what is the weight of equity in your financing source, uh, sources times cost of equity plus weight of debt times cost of debt. But we had a minor little thing here. Since using uh, debt has tax benefits, if you remember it from the income statement, if you have debt, you less, pay less tax because your taxable income is reduced due to the uh, interest payment. You're going to have something like this. For this, for, for this class, we don't have to worry about it. In real world, this is what people use because generally companies uh, finance their projects with debt and equity together. Şimdi hemen bir de Türkçe e, toparlayayım, toparlayabildiğim kadar. E, yapmaya çalıştığımız şey bu ders e, ve bir sonraki e, chapter'da e, iyi proje seçmeye çalışacağız. İyi proje seçmek için de ilk başta projelerin e, nakit akışını doğru bir şekilde hesaplayabilmemiz gerekiyor. O kısmını yapmak için tabii ki pek çok e, proforma e, şeyler kullanılıyor işte. Gelir bu kadar olur, gider bu kadar olur. Onların hesaplanması gerekiyor. Biz onunla çok uğraşmayacağız açıkçası. Yani bu şey değil. E, financial planning gibi bir ders değil. Onu yapmıyoruz. Ama nakit akışlarını, bul, akımlarını bulduğunuz anda daha sonraki e, şeyde ne yapacağız? Zaten present value hesabını da yapmayı biliyorsunuz. O yüzden zaten onlarla başladık. Present value'sunu hesaplayacağız. Bütün bu nakitlerin, bugünkü değerini hesaplayacağız. Bunu hesaplamak için neye ihtiyacımız var? İskonto oranına ihtiyacımız var değil mi? Neye göre iskonto edeceğiz? O kullandığınız iskonto oranının projenin riskini doğru şekilde yansıtabilmesi lazım. O iskonto oranı da o zaman neyle alakalı olacak? Nasıl bir kaynak kullandığınızla alakalı olacak? Eğer bir sürü borç aldıysanız borcun iskonto oranını kullanarak e, projenin şey e, nakit akışlarını, bugünkü değerini bulabilirsiniz. 
sadece e, öz sermaye kullandıysanız o zaman e, cost of equity, öz sermaye maliyetini, burada kafam sürekli Türkçe çevirmeye çalıştığım için yavaş yavaş gidiyor, öz sermaye maliyetini kullanabilirsiniz. Değişik yöntemler var. Ha bu derste onları gördük. Risk and Return chapter'ını ya da Common Stock Valuation chapter'larını gördük. Ama aslında onunla da çok fazla vakit harcamayacağız. Bu e, Derinle inmiyoruz hiçbirinin. Bunu da bulduktan sonra tek yapmanız gereken şey, e tamam nakitleri buldum, gelir giderler her şey belli. E bu proje iyi mi kötü mü? Ne metoduyla bunu bulacağız? İşte bu şeyde, chapter'da onu yapacağız. Ben size ta her şey verilmiş şekilde koyacağım önünüze. Ondan sonra diyeceksiniz ki bu metoda göre bu iyi bir proje, bunu almamız gerekiyor gibi bir şey yapacağız. So that's, that will be the takeaway from today's and Friday's uh, lecture hopefully. Okay, so basically what we're doing is this. We're gonna have the cash flows related to the project. Um, and then you're, you're gonna have the appropriate discount rate from the economy, from your project sourcing, whatever. Uh, sometimes at the end of the project, you, ha you may have a terminal value, like uh, maybe this is like a buying a, a factory kind of project. And at the end of, 20 years, maybe you're gonna sell the factor to someone else. So that may be the terminal cash flow you're gonna get at the end of the project. So you're gonna put all those cash flows in the, the uh, timeline uh, here, and then you're gonna discount all those cash flows. Um, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna use different decision rules to have an idea whether we should take this project or not, okay? So we're going to start with net present value, which is the easiest one to use. Uh, have you heard of net present value before? Net present value is very simple. It is literally net present value. So you're going to have the cash inflows. You're going to have the cash outflows, right? All the revenues, everything is cash inflow. All the expenses are cash outflows. So since you, you know cash inflows and cash outflows, and since you're going to make the decision whether you want to take the project now, Uh, you should calculate the present value of all those cash flows. So bring all those cash flows to time zero. And take the difference between outflows and inflows. The bigger the inflows value are, the better the project, right? So this is net present value, very simple. That's why I said you should know time value of many chapter very well, because everything else is based on, uh, built on it, right? So for the net present value, whenever net present value is greater than zero, So present value of inflows are higher than present value of outflows. You're going to take the project. That's it. Hocam, even for one dollar? Yes, even for one dollar uh, an NPV project, you can take the project. It is valuable. Okay? I mean, it's an extreme example. One dollar is nothing for IBM. IBM wouldn't even lift uh, their finger for one dollar. But theoretically, if NPV is higher than zero, you can take the project. Okay, so let's start with very uh, simple examples. Then we're going to go into more... Uh, actually, I don't think any there's anything confusing in this chapter. I think everything is very straightforward. Uh, but ask me if you have any questions. So suppose that you're going to invest $50 today and $60 later today. So in the morning, you, have <clears throat> in, you invested $50 and later today you're going to have $60. So what is the increase in your value today? Ten dollars, right? This is NPV. You automatically did NPV anyway. So is this a good investment? Yes. Tabii şu anda doların bu kadar şu an fırladığı bir günde de bunu söylememiz biraz şey oldu. On dolar ama Türk parasına çevirsen çok yüksek bir şeyde denk geliyor, değil mi? Uh, so your profit basically from this investment is you have the outflow of fifty dollars, you have the inflow of sixty dollars. So net present value of this investment is ten dollars. So now make it one step more difficult. Suppose that you're investing $50 today and receive $60 in one year. What is our increase in value given a 10% expected return? So what am I going to do? I'm investing $50 today, which is my cash outflow. Uh, since I'm going to make the decision today, I will calculate the present value of the inflow as well, which is $60. So I'm going to calculate what is the present value of the $60. So how am I going to do it? $60 will be given to me in one year. 
So let's discount it one period back, which, which uh, with 10% discount rate. So the value of this investment will be $4.55, right? You're putting $50, you're gonna get $60 in one year, and its value is $54.55 for now, for today. So the uh, increase in the value is, is around $5. So this is the MPV. Any questions here? Very simple, right? Very easy to understand. Okay, so let's focus on real, uh, uh, real projects that uh, we're gonna use this example a couple more times uh, throughout the chapter. So suppose that you're thinking about buying an office building and the cost of the building is $350,000, $350,000. And in one year, you forecast that you can sell it for $400,000, for uh, $400,000. So suppose that you look at equally risky investments and uh, you figure, figure out that cost of capital will be 7%. So the discount rate you should use is 7% from equally risky investments, you figure that out. In that case, if you're interested, uh, you, uh, your question should be, okay, should I buy this building or not? I'm gonna pay 350, I'm forecasting to get 400 in the future. Is it a positive MPV or a negative MPV project? So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna bring that $400,000 to today by the discount rate. So that's it. Uh, so the value of the sale price today will be 373. So is this a good investment? Yes, would you buy that building? Yes, this is a positive MPV project because cash outflow is less than the cash inflow you hope to get, okay? So this is positive MPV. One problem you can see is, I'm, I said, okay, suppose that discount rate is 7%, this is what equally risky projects offer, but discount rate is not very easy to come up with, actually. So suppose that instead of 7%, uh, the discount rate is actually 12%, okay? So you miscalculated your discount rate, okay? Or misassumed your, your discount rate. In that case, what's gonna, it's, it's gonna affect, it's not gonna affect how much money you put, you pay for the uh, office building today, but it will affect you, uh, the, the sale price in one year. So the value, or the, the value of the sale price for today. So $400,000 with 7% discount rate, its value was 373, but if you use like a 12% discount rate, its value will, will be reduced to 357. So here, it is still a positive MPV project, but it decreased your, uh, the, the uh, value a lot of, uh, uh, decreased decrease the value a lot, okay? So from 373 to uh, 357. So the point is the discount, uh, picking the right discount rate is important. For big amount of money, discount rate will affect your calculations even more. So if you're playing with uh, $5 million, $50 million, of course, even like a decimal point uh, mistake in, the, in your uh, discount rate will affect your, your uh, decision. So what do people do? They do a sensitivity analysis, okay? They use different discount rates and they determine the MPV with di different discount rates. At the end of the day, uh, as managers, you have to make a, make a call. So you should say, okay, with this economic uh, prospects, we expect this discount rate to be this much. So we're gonna assume this discount rate is this much and you will go with the uh, project or not. So you have to go with your gut feeling in that case. So this is uh, MPV. Uh, the more cash flows you have, the more calculations you're gonna make, but the idea is same. So basically, calculate the present value of all the cash inflows and cash outflows, calculate the present value, that's it. Simple uh, time, uh, time value of money uh, idea, basically, it's nothing. Okay, um, so let's look at multiple cash flow example. Um, this time, instead of buying an office building, uh, no, uh, sorry, uh, you, you're still thinking about buying the office building and you, you're gonna pay 350, uh, okay, you don't know how much money you're gonna pay yet, sorry, the, the question changed, uh, but you know that you have a tenant, so you can rent the building for $16,000 per year and you're gonna keep this building for three years and then you will sell it at 450 uh, at the end of three years. So what is the price 
at most you're going to pay for a building like this. <coughs> how, how do you calculate it? Uh -huh. So now you're trying to make a decision, okay, this is the money I can spend on an office building like this. So how much uh, you can put in your, uh, you can put aside to buy a building like this. Nasıl bulabiliriz bunu? So basically, you have. So basically, you have something like this. You're gonna keep the building for three years, and you know you already have a tenant, and they're gonna pay sixteen thousand to you every three years. And at the end of the third year, you know you can sell the building for four fifty. So in that case, what is the price? you would pay for this kind of building at most. So basically, hmm? oh, yes. you remember annuities, perfect, exactly. So what you can do is basically, you're gonna calculate the present value of all those cash flows. You can do it individually, okay? You already know how to do it individually. So you have 16,000, what is the discount rate? Uh, Seven ma? Okay, seven percent. Uh, Sixteen thousand over one hundred seven to the power two. Uh, here you have four sixty six over one hundred seven to the power three. So you can add them up, and you would know what is the present value of all the cash inflows you forecast to get. Or uh, simply, you can do uh, this whole thing will be equal to sixteen thousand dollars. Annuity, it's a three year annuity with 7% discount rate. And plus, you know, at the end of the third year, you're going to get 450. Uh, so let's just write it like this. Okay. So it's going to be the same thing. So if you do this, the present value of all the cash inflows are this much 409323. Uh, After making this calculation, would you buy a building for $420,000? No, so this is the money you would pay at most, right? If you pay this much, then this is gonna be a zero MPV project, right? So the less money you pay for the building, the better it will be for you. <coughs> MPV will be positive, right? Okay. Okay, perfect. Um, so it says if the building is being offered for sale at a price of 350, would you buy the building? The answer is yes. Uh, what is the added value generated by your purchase and management of the building? So what is your MPV in this case? If you pay 350 for the building, this is present value of cash inflows. This is the present value of the cash outflow. So the NP. Uh, the value uh, will be equal to 59.323. It's a positive MPV project as expected, so you would take the project. You would buy the building. So very simple, right? There is nothing to be scared of about MPVs. Okay, good things about MPVs. One, we are using cash flows. So cash flows cannot be manipulated like earnings, if you remember. Do you remember the difference between net income and cash flow from chapter 3? Do you remember that? So income and cash flows are different. So we were making adjustments to net income to calculate cash flows. So we were adding, uh, what we were, we were adding depreciation. We were deducting capital expenditure. Do you remember all those? Okay, you don't. But this is what we do, uh, what we did. And the good thing is, since we're dealing with cash flows, you cannot manipulate cash flows like earnings. So MPV is good in that sense. MPV uses all the cash flows about the project. So this is a three-year uh, project. MPV uses all of those three years. So you will see that in some methods, this is not the case. So MPV is, is good uh, in that case. The other one is MPV discounts the cash flows properly. So MPV uses a discount rate in the economy, which is also something good. Uh, and in some of the other methods, this is not going to be the case. So MPV is used a lot. 
Uh, this is from Graham and Harvey uh, survey from 2001. They talked to the CFOs and they said, which method you use to pick projects. So if, uh, as you can see, almost 80% of CFOs CFO said we're using MPV. So it looks simple, but it is widely used by the CFOs in real world. Uh, IRR is another method we're going to talk about. Uh, internal rate of return is another method. There's the payback period. This is the easiest one, uh, actually, but it is widely used. More than 50% of CFOs use that one as well. So you have rate of returns. These are accounting uh, ratios. And then there's the profitability index as well. So MPV uh, is widely used in the, in the uh, economy. Uh, why are we uh, looking at other methods? Because some of them are very easy to calculate. They are still used in the economy uh, by the practitioners. Uh, I think it's good to double check uh, with uh, different methods as well. So you make a decision with one method, but you should use other methods as well. So let's, after MPV, let's go uh, to another method, which is the payback per, uh, method. This is very simple to understand. Um, and I always give the same example, uh, but I think it's very straightforward, so I will go with that one. When I was in US, um, I didn't have a washing machine. So in the beginning, I said, okay, and I don't want to use laundromats because you don't know what kind of people use laundromats. So I said, okay, I will just uh, wash things by hand. It's worked only for a week, let's say. And then I said, no, I need a washing machine. And washing machines are very uh, expensive. And actually very low quality as well. We have very interesting washing machines. Like there, we have the, the old, old ones. Like you put the uh, laundry from here, you know, like the lid is on the top. Like, interesting. Okay. Uh, so I said, okay, I'm going to buy a washing machine. Then they told me, we have a guy. We have a Turkish guy. So he, he fixes the washing machines and sell it to Turkish people for $50. For non-Turkish people, $75, okay? So I said, okay, $25 discount is, is pretty good. So um, I had to make a decision. I said, okay, is $50 is too much or not, okay? Right? It doesn't seem like too much, but still you have to think whether laundromats are better uh, thing, uh, is a better way. Uh, so for laundromats, I think every wash was $2 or something, and then you have to use a dryer as well. So it's another $2. Let's make it $5 for easy calculation. So if every week I'm spending $5 on laundries, what is my payback if I buy the washing machine? Payback uh, period. 10, 10 weeks is my payback period. That's it. This is seriously what CFOs use as well. So the, the pay, pay, payback method. So basically we will try to figure out how much time is needed until you recover the cash you paid for the, for the project. That's it. Evet, aynen. Uh, okay. I bought the wish machine, of course. Not the dryer, just the washing machine, like Turkish style. We don't like dryers, we like the washing machines. Okay, so uh, in that case, CFOs will have a time, like cutoff time. So uh, if the CFO says, I'm going to take all the projects which will, uh, whose cash flows will be recovered in two years, then you're going to pick all the projects uh, in that cutoff uh, period, let's say. Then let, let's look at an example. Suppose that I have three different projects, A, B, and C, uh, very innovative names for, for projects. So they all cost $2,000. Project A, A's cash flows are like this. Uh, in the first year, you get $1,000. In the second year, $1,000. In the third year, you get $10,000. For B, you get $1,000 in the first year, $1,000 in the second year. In C, you get nothing in the first year, uh, 2,000 in the, in the second year. So if the, the company says, I'm going to uh, accept all the projects with two year or less payback periods, which one looks good? So you spend $2,000. How long it takes to recover $2,000 for project A? Two years, right? How about B? Two years. How about C? So in that case, you would take all those projects, right? They're all, they all have acceptable payback periods. Did you just realize what we ignored? What kind of problems we have? Like, do you think A and B are similar projects? Like, 
good, good, uh, they're both very good, like equally. Which one is better? See, in the payout, payout period, payout period uh, method ignores all the cash flows after the cutoff. So for the uh, payout uh, method, this doesn't mean anything. Remember I said in MPVs we use all the cash flows, which is good. In payback, we don't, use, we don't do that. Did, are you, uh, did you notice something else? Huh? Time value of money. We completely ignore time value of money. We said this, this, is, say, uh, this is same with this one. It both takes two years to recover. So if you calculate MPVs uh, for those projects with 10% discount rate, MPVs would be like this. Actually, B and C are negative MPV projects. You wouldn't take those. You would go with the first one. So pay, wh why do people still, like CFOs, use payback periods? Remember, 50% of the CFOs use payback periods still. Why do they do it? Because it's very easy to, to uh, explain to people. Very easy. Like bakkalamca method, basically. It's, it is widely used. So uh, we said, OK, uh, we are ignoring something very important. We are ignoring time value of money. So we can actually uh, deal with that. And we can use discounted payback periods. So in the discounted payback period, we're going to discount all the cash flows. That are, we will bring all those cash flows to time zero. Then we're going to say, OK, it takes only this much time. So instead of just adding the numbers up, and ignoring the time value of money, we're going to discount the cash flows to figure out how many, time, uh, how many years we need for the payback. Uh, let's look at this. Um, OK, let, let's look at the example. If a project costs $5,000 and will generate annual cash flows of six sixty dollars for 20 years, what is the payback period? So. First, use the regular payback period. So it says the cost of the project is $5,000. And every year, you're going to have $660. OK, I don't know how long it takes. And the cost is $5,000. So how, long, how many years is necessary to uh, recover your initial investment? How do you calculate it? It's very easy. 5,000 over 660, right? Mm -hmm. Which is equal to? When we use this, we're ignoring the discounting. Uh, discounting. We, we ignore time value of money. We take those 660, same with this 660, which is incorrect. So if, you want, if I want to use the discounted payback periods, what should I do? Hmm? Yine 5000 eşitleyeceğiz. So basically in that case you should discount all those 660s, okay? And then find the point where the cumulative number will uh, is equal to 5000. Şunu sileyim mi? Şunu silebilir miyim? Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to discount those 660s, okay? And the discount rate is uh, 6%. So you're going to do 660 over 106, 660 over 106 to the power 2, 660, 106 to the power 3, blah, blah, blah. And you will find the year where you accumulated $5,000. So this is good. Now you're, uh, you're, not, um, you're considering time value of money as well. The easy way to do this to use an annuity formula. Annuity formula does the same thing, right? Annuity formula discounts all those cash flows anyway. So what you should do is, I want the value of the, all the cash flows to be equal to 5,000. And 660 is my payment. From here, I'm not going to write the uh, formula. But from here, uh, I know I'm using 6% discount rate. So you need to calculate T from this uh, equation which will be equal to, hmm, which will be equal to, I don't have the, um, it should be less than, do you have the book? Is there anyone who has the book? No. Uh, it should be something like, huh? 10? 
it wasn't maybe you're on it might I think it was 12 or something I don't know uh, do you have like an easy calculator kind of like huh Respect. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> yeah, so it's something like 10. Of course, it was going to be more than 7, right? Because this time I'm discounting uh, those cash flows. So with the discounted payback period, I'm, uh, the good thing is I'm never accepting a negative MPV project like the regular payback method. Uh, but also, the, the same disadvantage uh, persists. Uh, if, if this is a 20-year project, and if your cutoff point is 10, uh, this method ignores all the cash flows from uh, year 10 to 20. So it only looks at how long time is necessary to rec recover the initial investment. That's it. So any questions about payback method and discounted payback uh, methods? OK. Uh, the last, uh, not the last, uh, but uh, another method to use is internal rate of return. This is also widely used. Let's go back to our graph. It's almost uh, as no, more, more popular than NPV. So we are done with NPV. We understood payback. Now we are looking at IRR. So what is IRR? It is internal rate of return. What does it mean is it basically looks at, it, it, tries, to find, it tries to find the discount rate that will make NPV equal to zero. So let me go back and repeat myself. Internal rate of return is the discount rate that will make NPV equal to zero. Hojam, how are we going to find IRR? Uh, unless we ask an NUT question, you cannot find IRR with multiple cash flows. But if it's NUT, I'm hoping that you can find IRR, right? If you had something like this, if you know the T, you can find IRR, right? So any ra rate that will make MPV equal to zero will be your internal rate of return. And from the table, you should be able to cal calculate uh, IRR, basically, hopefully. OK, so um, let's go. OK, the rule with IRR is you're going to accept all the cash flows Bu genelde tabii sıfır olmuyor. Buradan sıfır nereden çıkacak diye düşündünüz değil mi? Burada genelde bir de şeyiniz oluyor tabii şurada. There's initial investment in general. So you're, you're putting initial investment to the to other side. So generally it is something like this. So you can you can find IRR from here. Karıştı mı? Demeye çalıştım şey. So basically you have something like this. So you're trying to make MPV equal to zero. Since your initial investment is generally negative, it goes here as a positive number. So if you have an NUT here, it's basically payment times PUVFA part. So from there, you can use the table. Sayı olmadığı için karışmıştır. Çok basit bir şey. Yani yaptığınız, bildiğiniz bir şey söylüyorum aslında. Şimdi sayılı halinde görürüz zaten. Okay, um, so the rule with IRR is you're gonna, uh, we should accept all the projects whose IRR is more than the opportunity cost of capital in the economy, which will make MPV higher than zero, basically. That, that's the idea. So you're gonna take uh, the projects whose IRR is higher than the opportunity cost of capital. Let's see it over an example. So this is the same example we use. You can purchase a building for 350, the investment uh, will generate $16,000 uh, in cash flows during the first three years. At the end of three years, you will sell the building for four fifty. What is the IRR on the investment? So basically, what we're going to do is, so you're going to do, OK, you can purchase the building for three fifty. This is the initial cash outflow. And you know that for three years, you can get the rent. OK. You can get the rent at $16,000. I don't know the IRR. I know I can get this money for three years. And it also says, at the end of three years, you will sell the building for four fifty. dollars 
So it's going to be something like this. So you have the 350 initial investment, you have $316,000 rent. At the end of the third year, you get the 450. Huh? So this is 450 and this is $16,000 annuity. It's the same thing. So from here, you should calculate IRR. Hocam, how are we going to calculate IRR? Uh, with calculators, you can't. Uh, with financial calculators, you can. Uh, and you can use the Excel to do that. So basically, you have the cash outflow of 350, and you have $16,000 in the first year, $16,000 in the second year. In the third year, you have 466, the lost rent plus the sale price. So if you use the IRR function on Excel, you can find IRR. Or if we, if I, uh, or if it was something like this, you would also be able to find IRR very easily, right? So once you know, find it, it is 13%. So you will have something like this. So if you calculate, if you um, draw the MPV profile, this is MPV profile. What is the MPV of the projects with different discount rates? This 13% is the one that will make MPV equal to zero. So here I, am, I have the X, uh, X intercept, basically. So if the discount rate, if IRR is higher than the discount rate in the economy, if IRR is higher than the discount rate in the economy, I'm here, so I have positive MPV. I should take the project. If IRR is less than the discount rate in the economy, I'm here. So in that case, it's a negative MPV project. I shouldn't take the project. OK, so this is the IRR rule. Take all the projects whose IRR is higher than the opportunity cost of capital in the economy. Uh, OK. Now let's take a break then, and then we will continue. <laughs>